Good morning. How are you today? It's warm, but not too warm. <laughs> There's a breeze, but not too strong. And the sun is out, not too bright. It's a good day. It's also a good day for those of us who've been demanding a reckoning. And there are two uh, locations where the reckoning is uh, gathering strength. One is in a courtroom in Detroit, Michigan, where a federal judge wrote a hundred page uh, memorandum order against uh, Sidney Powell and seven other lawyers that came into her court and misrepresented the facts as to corruption requiring setting aside the election, the presidential election. The judge decided that sanctions were important and is having the eight attorneys pay the court cost for what the government had to do in response to the frivolous action. But she did something else as well. She sent along the information to the Bar Association of the jurisdiction whence these attorneys were from. That's a reckoning. Now, in an ordinary case, even one hotly contested uh, the judge has the parties pay their own fees. But this is an extraordinary case in the sense of the hearing that was had before the judge for six hours or more in which these lawyers could not identify facts supporting the claims they made in court. The second thing is that this is an issue that's important as a predicate for our government, that is democracy, and they were attacking at the root of that fundamental value, the election as fraudulent when it was not. So the misconduct and the severity of their misconduct, in a sense that goes beyond a parochial ordinary case, is what put the judge in this position. Why 100 pages? Because it is unusual. In America, you pay for your own champion, if you will, if you get a champion. And uh, these are hotly contested arguments in court. And most judges are aware of that. But this went beyond the pale, to borrow an Irish phrase. OK, now the second venue where a reckoning is coming is on the Hill yesterday. Subpoenas went out to, I think it was 18 agencies. The significance of these subpoenas is not only that they exist, but what they're asking for, which is not about the rioters. It's about everybody else. It's about the White House. It's about intelligence and so forth. And there is a specific request for communications on January the 6th between persons in the White House and the Hill. That's significant. Also, there is a request for information involving the vice president. Because if you remember in some of the narratives, it looks like there are people with Pence trying to get him off the Hill to prevent him from being present for the pro forma action of approving the electors who chose Biden as their president. So that's significant. Will the cowards amongst us in the Justice Department and elsewhere grow a spine that a reckoning is occurring? That's the question that remains to be seen. Any opportunity you get, say, <laughs> get to work. We cannot tolerate this. You would prosecute us for jaywalking and these guys are committing the highest crimes in the land against our form of government. Now, looking at uh, Afghanistan, I've said all that I really have to say, and I don't understand the perpetual rehash, which appears to be the disadvantage of Biden, and thereby, and thereby making people terrified, Americans and others. But you have to ask yourself why the White House sent Harris to Vietnam, evoking what happened in Saigon, I suppose, but her mission is to give one million vaccines uh, to the government there in, Viet in Vietnam. And that would be a wonderful thing, except it's like poking 
the Chinese bear, if you will, because China feels, because of geographic proquinquity and everything else they do, that this is an interference by the United States in Vietnam. And the Vietnamese are chary of accepting this too friendly gesture at a time when Afghanistan is happening uh, because China is so near. So I think that was a faux pas. I don't think we should have done that. I think we should have kept our nose to the grindstone and did everything we could and continue to do what we're doing in Afghanistan. But that's me. Uh, there's a, a story out of Harvard that I'm interested in. It is that they have chosen a chaplain who may be an atheist, who thinks of himself as spiritual and not affiliated with any religion. Now, if you think about this in terms of individual rights and liberties, a chaplain for a school as well considered as Harvard seems out of place. But if you want to be fair, how do you choose a chaplain of any religion for a diverse, diverse university that includes people of faith and non-faith, believers and not believers? And these days, when you see that some of the most virulent and hateful rhetoric comes from some people, I call them faux Christians, how can you be affiliated with a religion, embrace the Sermon on the Mount, and think that somehow or other, that's just fine? I recently did a reading, which I've never done in my life, and so I just feel it was appropriate to a person who's, uh, well, suffering maybe his final days or a very difficult recovery. And I read the Sermon on the Mount to him. And I could tell that it gave him great hope because he's a strong believer and he is religiously affiliated and he would never do the things these folk Christians do or believe. He's a gentle and kind man. And uh, when reading it, some of the expressions even in the Sermon on the Mount about take out your own eye, cut off your hand, they're things that I hadn't considered because I guess I focus on basically the golden rule. You know, feed the hungry, help the sick. And I think those are the values that are preeminent in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, <laughs> the gentleman that I was reading this to asked me if I was, uh, I was a, a priest. He, know, he knows me. He knows I'm not a priest. But it's ironic because the Jesuits were always after me to become a priest. Uh, I needed to be in the field of action. And uh, that, that didn't suit me because like the new chaplain up at Harvard, I think of myself, if anything, as uh, spiritual and not religiously affiliated anymore. I'm a fallen Roman Catholic, Irish from the Bronx. So those are a few of my thoughts today, some favorable ones. And so uh, go forth and do great things and remind everybody a reckoning is coming. Bye-bye.